Across the Pacific coast of Japan, Japan's Pacific coast is between one and 2,000 miles long. And across that coast, there are hundreds of these standing stones there, and some of them are centuries old. And many of them have inscriptions on them. They've come to be known as tsunami stones because they're there to mark the spot usually that a tsunami came up to in the past. This one right here is known as the Aniyoshi stone, and I don't read Japanese, but I have it on good authority that what, what this says on it is, high dwellings are the peace and harmony of our descendants. Remember the calamity of the great tsunamis. Do not build any homes below this point. The most powerful earthquake that was ever recorded in Japan happened not that long ago. It was March 11th, 2011. And that earthquake triggered a tsunami which left approximately 20,000 people dead or missing. And it also led to, it triggered a, a nuclear disaster at the Fukushima nuclear plant, which in some ways over here kind of overshadowed the tsunami and the earthquake in the news at the time. But these old stones actually saved a number of lives on that day. People who walked by them as they, they grew up, saw what they said, and realized on that day, I'm not going to go down and check out my house after the earthquake and make sure everything's okay. I'm going to go up in case water comes up. And it probably saved some lives of people who knew about these stones and didn't buy or build below that point to begin with. There's a Japanese proverb talking about natural disasters that says, the great disaster always strikes when the last one is forgotten. After the 2011 tsunami, there were a lot of older Japanese people who voiced regrets that they didn't do more to warn younger generations of the risks of them and, and to prepare them, that they didn't say more things about it because people above a certain age would have remembered the, the 1960 Japanese tsunami or even going back to the 1946 one, and they regretted that they just didn't do more to warn people in advance. These stones that have been put up, and some of them are centuries old, they're the product of a really intense communal loss. These are, these are people who lost their families, they lost their homes, they lost their whole cities. And what good can possibly come out of that? Well, well they thought, well, if there's one positive thing we can do, we can warn people. And so they, they put in the effort to put up monuments like that, knowing that they're not even going to ever meet the people that they're probably warning. These are people, they're children's 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 children, uh, many generations far into the future. This stone here actually is, is believed to be a marker of the 869 Great Tsunami, more than a thousand years ago. There's a professor of disaster planning at Tohoku University named Fumikino uh, Imamura, sorry, Fumihiko Imamura, and he says, it takes about three generations for people to forget. Those that experience the disaster themselves pass it to their children and their grandchildren, but then the memory fades. There was a large U.S. study on disaster preparedness that revealed that uh, warnings conveyed person to person were far, far more valuable than every other possible means of, of disaster preparedness, more than all the public service announcements or, or safety drills or other government initiatives. The most important thing was to get people to talk to people, for, for people to see that you have a fire extinguisher in your kitchen, and you have potable water in your basement, those kinds of things. You talking about, well, well, I live in this floodplain, I, I bought insurance. You know, it's, it's person to person interaction that really matters. Because if you want to prepare people for a disaster, they need to see someone that they know preparing for that disaster. People do what's necessary when they see others doing what's necessary. But, you know, I'm not really talking about tsunamis here, am I? We're, we're 700 feet above sea level here, I think, something like that. What I really want to talk about is the church, about what it means for us to respect the wisdom of elders in the church. For the church to continue to grow in grace and knowledge, we need our elders' wisdom, the wisdom of our older members, our pillars in the church. We're, I think, quite familiar with the fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 12, which says, "'Honor your father and mother,' And the Apostle Paul added in Ephesians, he said, this is, this is the first commandment with a promise. And that promise is, 
that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And then this commandment gets widened in the, in the next scroll of the Bible, in the, in the Leviticus scroll, or Leviticus 19.32. You shall rise before the gray-headed, not just your mother, not just your father, anyone in your community, the gray-headed, and honor the presence of an old man, and fear your God, I am the Lord. And this command's interesting. It, it acts as, also as kind of a safety net for older people because it ensures that we as a community are going to take care of those who are older. We're not going to forget them. We're not going to just leave them to, uh, to fend for themselves, especially as, as you get older, you often face a lot of uh, challenges, some expected, some unexpected. And as you do that, sometimes your, your normal network is, is changing. Your, your, your parents, your friends, your siblings start to go away. And so the community needs to support these people. So it is a safety net. And that is to say also that, that we don't honor elders just for what they've contributed before or what they can still contribute right now, but just because they're part of our community. And so this is a right for you to claim just because you have gray hair or because you have no hair in some cases. You know, this, this is something for everybody. But what I wanted to talk about today is a benefit, a real benefit and a crucial role that our elders play within the church. That's the main thing I want to talk about because... God has brought us all here into his church, and he's brought us all in to be links in a chain, in a way. I think there's probably many of us who, when you're younger, you kind of have ideas of great things that you want to accomplish in your life, and some people do. And you might even think just generationally, think, when I and the people in my generation, you know, get to be in charge or something, we're going to do this or we're going to do that. And I think there's a point that you come to, many people do, where you realize, what, what if the most important thing that I'm going to do is to be the one who connects the people who came before me to the people who came after? I know, left and right, I'm doing the wrong thing. The people who came before me to the people who came after me, who are, who are coming after me. That the, maybe the most important thing I, I'm supposed to be here is a link in the chain that, that brings that lived wisdom across and God's truth. So, We grow and we make progress as a church whenever we build strong cross-generational relationships. That's that's when we grow. Because if we don't do that, what will happen is we'll always have this illusion of of progress, of doing new things. The church will always seem to be doing something new. And for a while, it'll feel like it is genuinely new. But then, you know, things will go on. You'll look back and you realize that we just continue to make the same mistakes our parents and grandparents made. Well, we just make the same mistakes in a slightly new way, with a slightly new twist on it. We grow, though, whenever that wisdom gets moved, moved across and built on. Younger people need to know what older people know. And that goes beyond just having a few conversations on the Sabbath. The big part of that is just finding ways, ways to work together. We have to do things together because so much of wisdom is caught more than it's taught, caught more than it's taught. And in that, I really appreciate living here in Cincinnati. We have a lot of opportunities for um, all kinds of activities and things, and uh, the planning committees we've had over the years, and and now the Welches here, uh, have done such a great job of of planning these things, that uh, many of which are deliberately designed to mix younger and older generations. And those are so helpful. It takes work to build those bond between generations, and it has to happen from both sides, from both directions. And there are some things that, that feel like barriers to it in a way. There are things that, uh, that make it feel like it's, it's harder than it needs to be. And just to call out some of that, one is that different generations communicate differently. Each new generation kind of you know, develops its own language, its own way of talking, and even sometimes kind of has its own paradigms that it looks at life through. And so that's, that's something to overcome when we come together and communicate. We have different interests. That happens as you age. We tend to have different things that we're passionate about. One thing is values. We, do we have different values? This I'm not sure about. I, it's my opinion. I guess, I guess it's my opinion on this. I, just some, something I want to put before you to consider, that maybe we don't have as different values as we think that we do. I think we share a lot of the same values within the church, but I think where the, the stress comes in is that 
we have a lot of different values, and we have different ways of talking about them and prioritizing them. And as a result of that, we might put the emphasis on a different syllable a lot of the time. And that, you know, between different generations, it can feel like, you know, this generation saying, well, why don't you care about this enough? While this one's saying, well, why don't you care about this enough? And so much of the time, it would be good to just step back and say, these are all things that are within the circle of, of what we care about a lot, that are our core values. And maybe just the answer is yes. <laughs> we need to do both of these things. And it's not so much a difference in values. It's just a difference in uh, the way we've expressed those values and, and which ones are just, uh, that just resonate right now to a different generation. Uh, but they're all necessary, and they all need to be prioritized. I'm on the hinge of middle age myself. I'm, I'm in my 40s now, so I feel like I, I, I'm getting to where I see this from both sides. I've got a couple generations older than me. I've got a couple generations younger than me now. And it's, I think it's easy to say, well, you know, I just, I just don't connect well with younger people. Or I don't connect well with older people. And the fact that we're different from each other is the point. <laughs> you know, that's the point of building the bonds is to be able to create those links that allows that wisdom to pass on. So what can we do? What can we do? I've got a thought here for older people and a thought for younger people. My thought for older people is very general. It's just a general approach to life. It's just to, when you look at younger people, when you look at the younger generation, just to maintain a positive disposition, a positive bearing, a positive outlook, uh, see the potential of, of uh, what can be there, even while you can look at younger people in a younger generation and say, there's all kinds of things here that have to change. They can't go on like this. They have to change. But be able to hold that and also be able to look past that at the possibilities that everybody has, to have a positive bearing. Because, you know, if there's a, if there's a young person who overhears me talking to somebody else about kids today, you know, and here's what's wrong with kids today, there's a good chance that they're going to take that and they may not feel very welcome starting or building a relationship with me because of that. And on the whole, I think that is something that, at least here, we've done very well. My kids have grown up here, and there have been so many people over the plus 70 group, I would say, who have done so much to, um, to, to get to know our kids and to make them feel welcome and make them feel a part of this church, and that is so valuable. It really makes a big difference in young people's lives. For those who are younger, I would say something that's, that's really obvious, uh, but sometimes we don't act as if we really believe it's true. <laughs> it's old people were not always old. Old people weren't always old. They weren't always the age that they are now. And sometimes, when I was a kid, I remember thinking, they've, they've just always been that way, <laughs> you know? But it's not true. They were young once too. And once you really understand that, then you realize something that follows from it, which is that uh, older people know more about what it's like to be you than you know about what it's like to be them. Older people know more about what it's like to be you than you know about what it's like to be them. In fact, every person walking around is sort of a combination of all the ages they've ever been. If you are an older person, if you're an 80-year-old, and if you are a wise 80-year-old, you, you remember your experiences. You remember how hard things were when you were younger. You have an appreciation for th how things might change and how younger people today might have different challenges. Those are all part of building wisdom as you get older. And when you have that, then you're not just an 80-year-old. You're also a 70-year-old, a 60-year-old, 50-year-old, 40-year-old, all those things in one because you've lived a long time and you've taken all of these memories and these experiences and you've thought about them and you've synthesized them into a perspective that is essential for our young, younger people to hear from, to, to know what you know. So older people, this is my message to younger people, older people need to be listened to. They can see things you can't see. They, they saw over that hill in the past, and they can see a little bit over that hill in the future, too, as a result. As the commercial says, they know a thing or two because they've seen a thing or two. These days, many of these old tsunami stones, these are eroding. They're wearing down. They're falling down. They're getting covered by vegetation, sometimes just being forgotten. People don't even know what they're, they're for anymore. But there's been a positive thing that's been happening since the 2011 tsunami as well. There's been a movement to build new, new monuments, to restore the old ones, to raise them up and, and put them back, and often even to 
just add a new marker, put a new standing stone next to the old one. The old and the new, just continuing the mission there side by side, continuing to warn and stand as witnesses to future generations. So let's remember to continue to honor our gray heads in our congregation and also build bonds with those that are younger than us so that we can pass on the wisdom of God that's been handed to us along with our life experiences that have been growing along with that wisdom and we've been learning things and seeing new angles on God's wisdom through the living of life. Pass that all on so that the next generation has that foundation to stand on. And then as the church goes on, it's going to progress in wisdom and grace. And even more that than that, we're going to be a church that's unified across time. 